for this movement. You do what you have to do to get what you want. You organize, you mobilize, you inform, you educate yourself, and you get that goal, okay? Yeah. Do not let anyone tell you. Do not And I want to tell you that I have my third illness and these shootings do not happen there. This is a uniquely American problem and it is because of this gun sickness that we have. And that he um, had actually called out for help several times, but no one really listened to him. He actually um, laid out on the floor prostrate and gave up his weapon and his guns because that day I was his mirror and I listened. I think that if we listen more and understand what it means and have knowledge in it, then we will make a difference in it. I know I didn't understand it until I was right there. Two days before that gunman came into the school when I tried to commit suicide, it was not my first time. Um, it was my last time because God needed me to save over 870 to sit in our desks at school, us having to be scared to go to restaurants or churches or concerts. I think we need to realize that these injustices aren't just history and they don't just lie in our history textbooks at school. They're present, they're our everyday lives. And I think the third step, like we've mentioned so many times before, is voting. And a quote I like to look to a lot is by John Lewis and he says, our most powerful, non-violent tool is our vote. So, since we have this, use it, and please keep the conversation alive, because that's the only way things are going to change. Very involved in school, and he graduated last year. And I don't want to share this story, because it's very trash to me, but like, um, no one would ever suspect him to commit suicide and shoot himself a gun, because we always thought that he was like that very involved person, and always wanted to do things and be about it. He was black and he was accused of doing something to two girls who weren't black. So like, he had that mental um, illness and he talked about it so much on Snapchat, the 24 hour story, you know, people post that stuff and people scroll through it so fast. But he was begging for help. And we all just scrolled through it and didn't listen to him. And to this day, we could have saved his life if we were to listen to him and included him in this conversation. Because mental health is such an issue, but it's such a taboo, and we never want to talk about it. Because we have to put on this mask and this face each day and go out like our lives are perfect when it's not. Mental health plays a drastic uh, factor in gun violence because people who have these guns claim to have mental health issues or they cry for that. And they really are going through things, and if we don't acknowledge it as United Citizens, we will be covered and drowned in mental health issues. So I pray for my friend, I sit here for my friend, and I live through him because we could have saved his life if we concluded him in this conversation. <laughs> Casey Cagle, Butch Miller, Bill Kowser, Stephen Henson, David Ralston, Jan Jones, John Burns, and Nathan Deal. How exactly does the NRA get in the way of passing common sense guns? I think it's pretty simple. The people trying to sell guns are trying to make it harder for us to prevent guns from getting into the wrong hands. And I also think it's important for all of us to remember two things. One, that our legislators shouldn't be bought out or voted in by corporations. They should be voted in by the people. They should listen to the people and not listen to us, but hear us. They need to hear us and listen to us. They can't just hear us, but then turn the opposite way and listen to the corporations who they are talking to behind closed doors. Remember, is that they work for us and not the other way around. We have to disrupt the entire political orthodoxy that has normalized death in communities of color.
We have to disrupt the myth that young people are not engaged, aren't mobilized, aren't fired up, or ready to go. With all our despair, with all our rage, and with all our hope, we have to vote. We have to stop training our children to be soldiers, because that's not our job. We aren't going into war, we're going to school. Why are we afraid? Why are we getting gunned down? Why is this happening? Why do lobbyists have more control over our public servants than the people? Who on here is like a high school student? I can show hands. Oh, your hand is, ooh, it's high, yes, yeah, awesome. So, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I just joined the Road to Change Tour to advocate for brown and black youth from effects by gun violence. But in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we have lots of um, walking in 12,224 youth go through metal detectors each day. And each day, they walk through the metal detector, they're searched, they're talked about, and they walk through there and they see armed guards, right? And with those armed guards, there's no guidance counselors or therapists to be there, to be there for the children. But instead, they take all the funding and put it into safety protocols. So while you're dehumanizing all these youth, making them believe that walking into the school where they're checked, talked about, and prodded walking out of their classrooms, they will be correlated into going to, um, into jail and prison because they believe that they are not a person that matters in that school. If you're walking into a metal detector each day, what are you gonna think? It's the same correlation to a prison. Our youth, especially in high areas where I come from, there's so many people of color there, that's where they insert all the metal detectors because they want to dehumanize these youth and make them believe that they can't leave that system. If you are confining these youth into the belief that they can't leave that system, they're gonna go and get that gun. They're gonna go and sell that dope on the streets. That's what's easier. That's the platform and accessibility that you're giving to them because you aren't giving them the chances to be successful. So the school to prison pipeline shows the same aspects of school, of prisons with schools. It's so correlated because we are confining our youth in these systems because no one wants to address the issue and get them out. I call Milwaukee a racially oppressive box and the four walls have to confine people of color because it's so true. Each day I go to school and there's so many people who think about Sorry, I'm sorry, y'all. This really gets me upset. I'm so sorry. I can't stress this enough because for years, people of color have been going to school with these armed guards, with these metal detectors, and all these requirements and restrictions. They can't be successful because there's so much funding taken out. There's no extracurriculars. There's no music class. There's no track. There's no things that give you the, the, the feeling that they're going to be successful because they're taking it out of the funding. They're putting it into safety protocol and not and not supporting our youth and putting them into leadership abilities and leadership roles. Do we want that for our government and for our reality right now? No. no, we don't because we are subjecting these youth into positions where they're not supposed to be in. And I can sit here right now because I have many friends who deal with this every day and they think it's okay. They think it's reality. And it's not our reality. It's time for us to change the narrative and move past this. We have not come together like this since Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so people are afraid. They don't know how to react. They don't know if you're coming out peacefully. They don't know if you're coming out riding. So what I would say to you is make sure that you and your peers and your students and all of you all that are around are always safe first. But just know that united you stand and united you fall. They can't get you all at one time. <laughs> Proposals, they are putting profits ahead of human life. That is the calculation that they're making. If we vote, we can create a compassionate, more just country and government. Vote! If they've ever had a conversation with one of the people in one of those communities, because those people know what it's really like in those communities, and you shouldn't talk about those communities without having to go there and learning from those people, because those people are the ones who are going to create change. And that's one of the main reasons why we went on this tour, to give those people the mic that we've been passed because we did come from Parkland, which is majorly white and, in, and powerful with our economics. 
And it's their turn, because they've been screaming. It's their turn for you guys to choose to hear them, so please do that. Our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about the things that matter. Our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about the things that matter. And there's so many things that matter in my community that people have not given us a platform to speak about. Each day, because I experience day by day gun violence. So like sleeping in my bed, you hear gunshots, that's normalized to me because growing up, no one told me that that wasn't okay. Growing up, when I hear gunshots, it's another day in the block. It's reality, it's conditioned for lots of people of color who live in inner cities and experience gun violence on a day-to-day -day spectrum because no one came in, had these panel discussions, and gave us a platform to share our stories and told us that it wasn't okay. That this reality that we're living in is not okay. Sitting in this chair right now, speaking about the things that I've seen growing up is not okay. And when you can say that a black boy shot in the street and him being walking back from school is gang violence because the color of his skin dictates his intention, that is not okay. And when that Call them illegal, that is not okay. But a white person who comes to a school, he's mentally ill, that is not okay. We can't compromise the community where gang violence is helpful because that's all we know. Guns give us identities, guns give us survival. We need a gun because we aren't safe. Police brutality is gun violence too. We need to have a discussion about that. Yeah. I think that gang violence is just a way that we can cover up the issues that we're dealing with in inner city communities because we gave up. For years, black people, brown people, anybody living in inner cities have been screaming for gun reform for years and years, and we're not given the same platform. And so I thank all of you for creating this, but this needs to change today. And with that, all of us sitting here can change that narrative. Because I want to grow up in my community. I want to have children. I want to flourish. But I can't flourish with this common threat of gun violence and gunshots are so conditioned, and it's my reality. Do you want that to be your reality? No. No. So why does it have to be mine? Warren is absolutely correct. I can't say it any better. I'll just say all of us in this room who are in positions of privilege should always keep in mind how can we lend our platform um, and our voice to, to communities of color. Um, let them have the mic. Let them have the stage. One thing that all of us can agree on is like we've stated so many times before, the people should rule the politicians, not the corporations. Yeah, and also, um, the, to get money out of big politics takes, it, that can just ease a lot of everything, and not just, you know. Repealing Citizens United would give the government That's what it does. That's what we need to do. Texas, when I came back to Georgia to launch my mentoring program, because I had parents calling me from Georgia to Texas because their babies were struggling and there was nothing there to support them. And so I launched my own mentoring program back into the Cab County school system where the gunmen held me hostage. But I did that because I wanted to allow those kids to know that I didn't forget about them. I want them to be able to know that they can be able to have a safe place. How many of us or want to stop our busy lives to take a moment. It only takes a moment to change one child's life. And we're so busy every day, we don't see that. So what happens now, our children are sitting there struggling. I went back to elementary school because I wanted those elementary kids to have a foundation. And we're in third grade. In third grade, my babies can't even read. They're on kindergarten level, and some of them are not doing that. So what about us taking one hour a week, going back into our schools to teach our children how to read? We know that everybody is making decisions, but at the end of the day, our children are our futures. If we don't stop for a moment to invest in our own, no one else is going to do it. As a blanket for your problems. Don't single out mentally ill people. Enough. Like, and my question is, 
what have what suggestions do you have to people like me who sometimes feel marginalized by all the talk about associating mental illness with gun violence? And it comes from both the left and the right. First of all, I would say thank you for coming up and speaking on this. No it is extremely important. And second of all, I completely agree with you. Coming from a history in my family of mental illness, I hate when I hear the news and people start talking and they blame mass shootings only on mental illness. Because the truth of the matter is, being mentally ill does not make you a sicko. It doesn't make you a murderer. It makes you a human being. If the only time you're thinking about mental illness is when you see a shooting on the news, then you are on the wrong side of And coming back to recycle to be able to help others as they get older to realize that we need to give back to our communities and somebody cares about me. That's what we're making difference. So the next question is for Lauren and Matt. How do you respond to the argument that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun? So, so this is how I like to think about it when people say that. When people tell me the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, I like to say those people sound like they're trying to sell me two guns. And, <laughs> More guns are not what's going to solve gun violence. Doing that is the same way like throwing fire at fire to try and stop a fire. It just won't work. The best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is prevent bad guys from getting a gun. said you don't stop a wildfire by starting more fires in the forest. This is an absurd deflection. You know what stops a bad guy with a gun? A bad guy with a gun is stopped by universal background checks. A bad guy with a gun is stopped by ATF visualization. A bad guy with a gun is stopped by sensible gun control policies. last three questions. Um, I do experience inner city gun violence day by day and it's been a struggle that I just was awakened to a year ago. And a lot of people living in my community, they're so hopeless because they think that they can't get out, so they're just going to conform to it. And I don't want that to be the mindset of our generation. We're not going to conform to the things that hinders us from being successful or even hinders us from having our own lives. So I guess that having this conversation right now is so, so progressive and beneficial because we need like-minded individuals to run this movement. And I would say in my community, we do a lot of um, registering people to vote, we do a lot of canvassing, and kind of reminding people that your voice is your power and your vote is your power. And if you use it, you can fuel the next revolutionary revolution. And I think that just getting all those youth together and like, because youth, right now, we're the, we're the future. We should be, yeah. because we are, we are threats right now, it's, it, it's threatened. And I think that it's so important that we can progress and make like these clubs, do the walkouts, make all things like March for Our Lives, just whatever affects your community and what goes best with it. Because right now, gun violence is a big issue in my community, but so is police brutality, so is home homelessness, so is getting fresh fruit in our community, and so many liquor stores are littered around it. So there's so many problems that we have. So narrow it down, find that problem, find that solution, and push towards it, because no one can start, stop your spark. 
And if they do, move around past them and keep going. That's all I got to do. I mean, people turn to the streets because they have nothing else to do. And we need to stop that. We need to put something there for them to do. Something productive. So, I mean, I think that's it. I mean, our children have nothing to do. We have no education. on the question by a show of hands, how many people know that the House representatives in the Senate in here in the state of Georgia are doing school safety meetings all over Georgia? How many of you all know that? Now look how many hands don't know. How many of you all don't know, didn't know that? You see why we got to change that? They're going around making decisions of what's going to go on in your schools for your students and your And you may, you may not have kids. My kids are grown, so they're not in school. But we got kids all over the world that are waiting on us. Summer Douglas in 16 days and when I go there me and all my other classmates are gonna have to walk through metal detectors um, we're gonna have to look at the 52 new, new cameras that they have on our campus so I've been thinking about that a lot too I've been thinking about how this place that we were built to feel safe to have an education has kind of turned into a prison and I've been balancing or trying to figure out how do we go to school and attempt to learn when we not only have to treat it as a safe place to learn, but also as a place where we need to protect ourselves. And I think the best thing we can do right now is try and focus on our studies so we can become the leaders that can change this so the future generations don't have it. I also would say if they do that, one of our most powerful tools, even though my mom yells at me for being on it too much, is social media. Post about it on social media. Have people retweet it on social media. And also, in a lot of places, people don't know this, when you're 18, you can run for school districts. So do that. If it gives you any comfort, I think someday when we look back onto the walkouts and the marches and the sit-ins that we've had, or I think, just know that someday when you're talking to your kids about these things, you'll have the power to tell them that you are on the right side of history. Yeah. You were one of the people that tried to walk out, and you were um, could we do something interactive? Can you guys repeat after me, please? I'm a church kid, so pastor's kid. Sorry, I went to church right now, so this is great for me. Um, I refuse, I refuse to, be to be another statistic. Another statistic. I, refuse I refuse to be, to be another, statistic. another statistic. Being the third most segregated city in the nation. Who all knew that? Milwaukee being the third most segregated city in the nation. Look around. It's about 4 a.m. And that's unacceptable. Us living in my community, we don't even know that ourselves because we're so used to seeing people representing us or people that are the same color as us. But elected in our seats are people who have never even lived in Milwaukee, but they're representing us as officials. And we do not want them there, so we're going to vote them out. And we vote Because our voices matter too, just like Lauren was saying, we've been screaming this for years. Growing up, me and my friends used to guess what kind of gun made that gunshot noise in the distance. That's not a game that children should be playing. And I've seen men lying in bodies, white covers over them. I just walk past like another normal day. I hear gunshots in the daylight. I walk past the bus stop like another day. And I don't want children, I don't want anyone in this room or people on this panel to think that that's okay. So being the third most segregated city in the country, we need to come together and have these discussions. If this conversation stays in this room and doesn't go out about, then you guys have felt it to me and felt you. We say that all the time as March for Lives because it's so important to communicate what's going on. If we're not unified in this, in this movement, then we're never gonna progress. 
I can sit here comfortable sharing my story because I need to. So many people back home do not have the courage to do it because they feel like their voices do not matter and that this mic does not belong to them. But I tell you that it does. It belongs to every single person in this room. This mic belongs to every single person in this room. And I want you guys to know that you need to refuse to be another statistic. All right, for our locals, what strategies have you found to be effective when talking to someone who may not? So my question is for the entire panel. Um, I was reading earlier today where um, Congressman David Cicilline of Rhode Island, he has been very active in the gun control movement. He introduced a bill that would ban 3D printed guns. My question for all of you is, what is your opinion on 3D, uh, 3D printed guns? Uh, 3D printed guns basically would it uh, completely eliminate metal detectors. You can walk into an airport with a firearm that can shoot the same amount of rounds as an AR-15. You can build an AR-15 from your house. That's scary. You don't need a permit. You don't need a background check with a 3D printed gun. You don't need anything. So, I don't know.